Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson in um, on science. In this lesson, we're going to carry on with quantitative aspects of chemical change. If you recall, we were busy working through some exam paper questions, and I always find that working through exam paper questions really helps us to get to grips with understanding the subject matter. So, like I always tell my students, the best way to do science um, is to study the theory so that you understand which equations to use and where to use them and the theory behind it and then to practice using the exam papers and old tests and then what you need to do is obviously as you're practicing you might realize where you're where you are lacking understanding and then you need to go back and restudy to to make sure that you understand what you didn't get in the first time okay so let's go through what we've done so far. We worked out, it said the reaction between magnesium and dilute hydrochloric acid is represented, and there it was, okay? It said during the experiment, 1.5 grams of magnesium reacts with excess dilute hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas at STP. Okay, it says it wants you to calculate the mass in grams of the hydrogen gas produced. So what we did was we used, you never compare mass with mass, okay? So what we did was we converted the mass of the magnesium to moles. Then we saw that the mole ratio was one to one. So then we used the mole ratio and multiplied by the molar mass of hydrogen to get the number of grams of hydrogen. Now it wants to know the mass in grams of magnesium chloride produced. So we can use exactly the same information. We have that naught, let me just change color so you don't get confused by all this writing. You get, we've got 0 0.063 moles of magnesium. But that, okay, do you see that the ratio, we're now looking at magnesium versus magnesium chloride. And from our theoretical equation, we can see that one mole of magnesium makes one mole of magnesium chloride, right? Which means that since we're making 0, 0, 0, 0.063 moles, or since we have 0, 0.063 moles of magnesium, we're going to make 0, 0.063 moles of magnesium chloride. So therefore, we, again, we're going to go mass is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass which is 0, 0, 0,063, but this time we have to multiply it by the molar mass of MgCl. And you can see that that's a bit bigger, so I'm going to write it over yes. The mass is equal to the number of moles, which is 0, 0, 0,063, multiplied by the molar mass of magnesium chloride. So first of all, the mass, the molar mass of magnesium is 24, plus two times, because it's sealed to, the molar mass of chlorine. Sorry, I pressed the button by mistake. The molar mass of chlorine, and if you check your periodic table, which I tell you to keep all the time with you, it gives you the molar mass of
sorry, I don't know what happened there. 2 times 0 0.063 and it equals, AC button, 0 0.126, 0 0.126. So now we've got 0, 126 moles of steel atoms. Okay, but that's not what they asked. They asked, what is the number of chlorine atoms? Okay, so we know that one mole has got Avogadro's constant, which is 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 elementary particles. Okay, in this case, the elementary particles happen to be atoms, but we don't have one mole, we've got 0 0.126 moles. So what we need to do is take 0, 0,126 and multiply it by 6.02 times by 10 to the 23, and that will tell us how many atoms we have. So we're going to take 0 0.126 and multiply it by 6.02 exponent 23 equals, and that is becomes 7.5 8, 5, 2, times by 10 to the 22. Again, remember we're always running off to the second decimal place. It's 7.59 times 10 to the 22. So that is 7, 59 times 10 to the 22 atoms. Okay. Right, now... Let us erase all our writing and do the next part of this. And in fact, since it's a new question, I'm actually just going to quickly go to this and do this and do that. Okay, right, and then go from current side. There we go, nice and clean. Easy for us to write on a cap. Now it says the empirical formula of a certain compound is to be determined. On analysis of the sample of the compound is found to contain 71,65% of chlorine, so 71,65%. It contains 24,27% of carbon, and it contains 4,07% of hydrogen. Okay, so the best way to do these things is to pretend that since it's all in percent, that we've been given a 100 gram sample. And out of that 100 grams, 71.65 grams makes up the chlorine, 24.27 makes up the carbon, and 4.07 makes the hydrogen. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to find the number of moles by dividing by the molar mass. So the molar mass of chlorine is 35.45. The molar mass of carbon is obviously 12, and the molar mass of hydrogen is obviously 1. So therefore, this becomes 4,07. Now we need to do the others. Oh, that's not going to work at all, is it? Um, let's go back there and then get the calculator. Okay. So we're going to go 24.27 divided by 12 which is 2.02, .02, so that's 2,02, .02. and then we've got 71,65 divided by 35,45 equals 2.02, .02. awesome, 2,02. .02. So these are supposedly the number of moles, okay, if we assume that we had 100 grams. Now what we need to do is find a mole ratio. So we divide by the smallest one of these, which is obviously 2,02. .02. So we divide this by 2,02. We divide this by 2,02. And we divide this by 2,02. .02. That's obviously 1 to 1, 2. I'm not sure. So let's do it. It's 4.07 divided by 2.02. .02 equals 2.01. Okay, so it's as close as anything to 2. Therefore, we can say that we have got CH2Cl. CH2Cl. Right, so that is the empirical formula. And what is the empirical formula? The empirical formula is basically the formula that tells you the ratios of the, the 
the elements. It doesn't necessarily tell you how many elements of, I mean, every type of element. Sorry, let's try again. It tells you the ratio of the elements. In other words, in this element, for every one carbon, there are two hydrogens and one chlorine. It is the most basic um, form of the formula of the compound. It doesn't mean that this compound only has one carbon in it. All it means is that the most basic um, ratios we can have for this compound are one carbon, two hydrogens, one chlorine. It could end up being six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six chlorines. We don't know, but the empirical formula gives you the most basic um, format of that formula. Okay, the basic ratio. Right, and then it says determine the broken formula, which we've done. Right, let's do another example. It says 13 grams of zinc, zinc, reacts with 6.4 grams of sulfur to form zinc sulfide. Okay, it says first of all, what is the empirical formula of zinc sulfide? Done. Okay, now. It says, what mass of zinc sulfide will be produced? Okay, so they're giving us 13 grams of zinc and they're giving us 6.4 grams of sulfur and they want to know the mass of the zinc sulfide that will be produced. So the first thing you need to do is work out which one is going to be the limiting reagent which one is going to be used at first admittedly it's a one-to-one -one ratio so that's quite nice so all we need to do is work out the number of moles of zinc and the number of moles of sulfur so whether we work them out is we're going to divide by the molar mass so the molar mass of zinc if you look at your formula sheet is 65,39 so let's work out what that is first so it's 13 divided by 65.39 equals 0,2. Do you agree? Because okay, this is 0,198. The 8 runs a 9 up, which then runs a 2 up. So it's 0,2. So zinc, there are 0,2 moles of zinc. If we now look at the sulfur, sulfur's uh, molar mass is 32,07. So its number of moles is, let's see, 6.4 divided by 32.07 is 0.2. Okay, right, 0.2. 0 0.2. So obviously, then we're going to form. 0.2 moles of zinc sulfide. Okay, awesome. Because it's a ratio of one to one to one. Okay, now we want to know the mass. Okay, so number of moles is mass over the molar mass. Therefore, mass is going to be number of moles times by the molar mass. So the number of moles is 0.2 multiplied by the molar mass, which is going to be 65,39 plus 32,07. I don't know why I didn't make that a square bracket. Okay, so let's put that in our calculator. So we've got 0 0.2 multiplied by 65,39 plus 32,07. Close bracket equals. So that's 19.49. So mass is 19,49 grams. Sure. Okay. Now it says what is the percentage mass of each of the elements in the zinc sulfide? Okay. So they just want the percentage composition. So if we want the percent of the zinc, it's going to be the molar mass of the zinc which is 65,39 over the total molar mass of the zinc sulfide, which is going to be 9 and 70, 16, 
that's a four, that's a seven, and that's a nine. Over 97 comma four or six. So let's just pop that in our calculator. So we got 65.39 divided by 97.46. Okay, wait, let me just go up and down and across and put a six there equals. And then that is going to give me 0,67, but if I times it by 100, it becomes 67,1%. 67,1%, which means that the sulfur makes up the rest, right? So that's just going to be 100 minus 67,1. So I can do that. I can go 100 minus 67,1. And that equals 32,9%. Therefore, the percentage of sulfur is going to be 32,9%. Okay, not too bad, hey? Let's look at another example. It says a calcium mineral consisted of 29.4% calcium, 23.5% sulfur, and 47.1% oxygen by mass. Calculate the empirical formula of the mineral. Okay, so we've got calcium, sulfur, and oxygen. They tell us this is 29,4%, this is 23,5%, and this is 47,1%. Now, remember what I said to you earlier, you need to assume that you are being given, you have been given 100 grams. Okay, and then these percentages represent 100 I mean, parts out of the 100 grams. So in other words, 29.4% now becomes 29.4 grams. The 23.5% becomes 23.5 grams. And the 47.1% becomes 47.1 grams. Sorry, internet disappeared there for a second. Ah, now it's back. Okay, so now what we're going to do is to get the mole ratio. So in order to do that, we need to divide each of these by their molar mass. So we're going to divide by the molar mass of each of them. So the first one we're going to divide by is calcium, which is 40. We're going to divide sulfur by 32 and oxygen by 16. So let's do that. So we're going to go 20, we might as well do it this way, 47.1, div, delete, divided by 16 equals 2.94. So oxygen is 2,94. Sulfur is 23.5 divided by 32, which is 0.73. 0,73 and calcium calcium is 29.4 divided by 40 which equals S button 0,74 0,74. So do you agree we now need to get a mole ratio? These are the these are the moles, but we need to actually get a mole ratio. So what we're going to do is always divide by the smallest number. So we're going to divide this by 0,73, which means we're going to divide this by 0,73 and this by 0,73. So obviously this is one, right? Now let's do the rest. Okay. 0.74 divided by 0.73 is going to be 1.01, .01, okay, 1, 1,01, which is basically 1 as far as we're concerned when it comes to ratios. Let's do this one. We've got 2.94 divided by 0.73, which equals 4.03. 4,03. So do you agree the ratio would be 1 to 1 to 1? Okay. Therefore, we can say that this is going to, I mean to 4, sorry. So this is going to be CaSO4, which is calcium sulfate.
There you go. Don't worry too much about these ones and threes. I mean, like as in 4.003 or 4.03. That's going to do with um, the fact that it depends on what periodic table you're using. Because, for example, calcium on most periodic tables is 40, but then on other periodic tables it says 40.08. So it might give you a slightly different number when you divide, and you might end up getting 0 0.73 there, which gives you one. So don't panic about that too much, okay? Right, now it says, when 207 grams of lead, which is PB, combined with oxygen, 239 grams of a certain oxide of lead is formed. Use a calculation to determine the formula of this oxide. Okay, all right. So we've got PB plus O2 forms something, something, we don't know. We're gonna, uh, we don't know, it's going to be P, B, X, O, Y. We don't know what this relationship is. Okay, do you agree? So we do know, however, that it is forming, that it takes 207 grams of this with the oxygen forms a certain oxide of lead and they want us to determine the formula of this oxide. Okay, we don't know if it's PbO2, Pb203, PbO3, we don't know. Okay, but we can use the 207 grams to determine the number of moles. And we know that this ratio has to be one, oh, that actually doesn't necessarily have to be one to one. Okay, so let the, oh, I know what it is. There has to, what you need to understand is that mass has to be conserved, okay? Mass has to be conserved. So we've got 207 grams here and 239 grams here, which means that we are using how many grams of oxygen? Okay, well, 239 minus 207 is nine minus seven is two, and that's 32. So we're using 32 grams of oxygen, okay? Which means we're using one mole of this, okay? So, if we're using one mole of this and the molar mass of lead, we're using one mole of this. And then the molar mass of lead, PB, if I can find it, is 207. So we're using one mole of this. Then we obviously have a formula of this has to be PBO2. Okay, it has to be PBO2 because there is a rule that says that mass has to be conserved. So the total mass of the reactants has to equal the total mass of the products. So therefore, it's 207 grams. Another way of doing it, instead of worrying about this, is you could have said, well, we started off with 207 grams, which is the molar mass of one mole, which is the molar mass of lead, therefore this is one mole. If you subtract that, we end up with 32 grams, which has to be oxygen. Molar mass of oxygen is 16, which means we need two oxygens, so therefore this is O2. So therefore the formula of this oxide is PbO2. Right, now let's talk a, bit, a little bit about molar volume of gases and molar concentration of liquids. What you've learned so far, what you should have learned by now, is that one mole of gas occupies 22.4 decimeters cubed at standard temperature and pressure. Okay, it doesn't matter if the gas is hydrogen gas, helium gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen, any gas, any gas whatsoever, ammonia gas, ammonium gas, whatever. Any gas will occupy 22.4 decimeters cubed at standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Um, concentration is a measure of the amount of solid that is dissolved in a given volume of liquid, and it's measured in moles per decimeter cubed. So concentration is defined as moles of a solute per unit volume. So it's C is equal to N over V, where N is the number of moles and V is your volume in decimeters cubed. Okay, so let's do an example. It says if 5.7 grams of sodium hydroxide, so that's NaOH, is dissolved in 
3.2 decimeters cubed of water, so it's a V is equal to 3,2 decimeters cubed of water. What is the concentration? What is the concentration? So we know the concentration equals number of moles over volume. So we need to work out the number of moles first. So we've got number of moles is mass over the molar mass, okay, which equals 5,7 over the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. So I want you to look at the periodic table and you will see that your molar mass of sodium hydroxide goes something like this. The molar mass of sodium is 23 plus the molar mass of oxygen is 16 plus the molar mass of hydrogen is 1. Therefore, you've got 5,7 over 40, which equals what? Let's go look at it. Let's find out. So we've got 5.7 divided by 40 equals 0,14. So it's 0,14 moles. Okay. But now we know the concentration is number of moles of a volume and they've asked the concentration. So we can go concentration is 0,14 divided by 3,2. So we're going to divide it by 3,2 and it's going to give us 0,044. Always two decimal places, it's 0,04. 0,04 moles per decimeter cubed. There we go. Right, next question it says, how much sodium chloride in grams will one need to produce 750 cubic centimeters of solution with a concentration of 0.02 moles per decimeter cubed? Okay, so that's interesting. They asked us, they said concentration is number of moles over volume. They've given us the volume, but it's in the wrong unit. We have to change it, okay? We've got the concentration and they want the mass, but we can get the number of moles and then we can say number of moles is mass over molar mass, and then we can work out the mass. Okay, so first things we're going to do is we're going to convert the 750 cubic centimeters to decimeters cubed. And by doing that, we're going to divide by thousands. So the volume now is going to be 0, 0,75 decimeters cubed, right? So therefore, concentration is number of, mo number of moles of volume. Therefore, number of moles is concentration times volume. The concentration they gave us, it's... 0,02. The volume is 0,75. So now we can use our calculators and we can multiply it. Okay, so we can say 0.02. No, 02 multiplied by 0.75 equals 0,015. 0,015. Okay, that's the number of moles we have. Now we want the number of grams. So we know that mass is going to be N times the molar mass. Okay, N, we know it's 0, 0, 0,015. The molar mass is the molar mass of sodium chloride. Okay, so sodium is Na, which is 23. And chlorine is Cl, which is 35,45. Right, so let's go get our calculator and pop that in, shall we? So we've got 0 0.015 multiplied by bracket 23 times 35, oopsie, 35.45 close bracket equals 12.23. So the mass, really, the mass is 12,23 grams. There you go. So that's how much sodium chloride one will need in order to prepare 
Um, a solution of concentration 0.02 with 750 cubic centimeters. Okay. Right. Okay, we're going to skip this question and move on to the next one. Okay, yes, no. Um, sorry, my bad. We're not going to skip the question. We're going to do it. What is the molarity of the solution formed by dissolving 80 grams of sodium hydroxide in 600 cubic centimeters? Now, molarity is the same thing as concentration. Concentration. So we know that concentration is number of moles over volume. They've asked us what is this concentration we would get if we dissolved 80 grams of sodium hydroxide in 600 cubic centimeters. So first of all, we need to change the mass to number of moles. So number of moles is mass over molar mass, which is 80 over what? It's over sodium hydroxide. That's Na. OH. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look for the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. We know that the molar mass of sodium is 23, the molar mass of oxygen is 16, and the molar mass of hydrogen is 1. So that gives us 40. So therefore the number of moles is 2. Okay, that's nice. Now it says what is the molarity, that's the concentration of the solution formed when dissolving that many grams of sodium hydroxide into two, in 600 cubic centimeters. But what is wrong with this cubic centimeters? It has to be in decimeters cubed. So we need to divide that by 1000 as well. Okay, so therefore the number of moles is 2 divided by 0.6. Because 600 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.6. And now we need to get out our calculators again. So we're going to go 2 divided by 0 0.6, which is 3.33. 3, 33 watt moles per decimeter cubed. There we go. Right, now... It says how many moles of sodium hydroxide are there in 350 cubic, cubic centimeters of a 0.75 mole of decimeter cubed sulfuric acid. Okay, so this time they want the number of moles. So concentration is number of moles over volume. We've got the concentration. We've got the volume, albeit in the wrong unit. We need to convert that to decimeters cubed and how do we do that we divide by thousand it becomes 0, 0,35 decimeters cubed and we want the number of moles so therefore number of moles is concentration times the volume so concentration is 0, 0,75 multiplied by the volume which is 0, 0,35 and that's going to give us a number of moles so again we need a calculator so we've got 0 0.75 multiplied by 0 0.35 equals 0 0.26. That's 0 0.26 watt. We are working out the number of moles. That's just the number of moles. End of story. Not too bad, hey? Right, so for the last five minutes, what I'd like to do for this lesson, I'd like to start the next section, which is vectors and scalars. Now, I know we've just gone from chemistry to physics, but it is important and it is the next section. Um, yeah, so let's get going. So, what you need to know is that everything we can measure can be divided into two groups. You've got scalars and vectors. You guys know this stuff already. Okay, or you should know it. Scalars are physical quantities that have magnitude only. And I've had students in the past who've really struggled with this word magnitude. It means big, okay? How big is it? Okay, but there's no direction. There's no direction. In other words, um, if I said to you, I've, oh, if I said to you, I walked two kilometers today, okay, and you know, that's not very impressive at all. But if I said to you, I walked two kilometers straight up a mountain, wow, that's impressive, okay? Why? Because it's a lot more effort required. Okay, so do you understand that direction actually plays a huge part in giving an idea of what is going on? Okay, now vector 
is a physical quantity that has both magnitude and direction. In other words, it's got size and direction. We represent it with a force vector because it is a as a represents the force vector um, with F representing the magnitude of the force. So for example, if we want to represent the force vector, okay, there are a whole bunch of different types of vectors. Again, we'll discuss them at the moment. And what we do is we put a little arrow above it. So most people don't do this so much anymore. We don't put little arrows above it, okay? It's kind of implied by, the vectors implied by the fact that it's got direction on it. But um, I'm finding that a lot of people um, a lot of the older textbooks have that arrow, so then my students don't know what we're talking about. So let's just understand that if there is an arrow above it, then it's a vector. Okay, so let's talk about the differences between these scalars and vectors. Again, a scalar is just the number, no direction. Okay, whereas a vector has got direction. So here we go. Scalars for example, would be a distance, like I said, I walk two kilometers. Displacement is I walk two kilometers up here. Okay, but traditionally, the displacement direction is more like north, south, east, west, left, or right. Okay, not necessarily up, okay, or uphill. Okay, the difference between mass and weight. Okay, I often say this to my students is that I know that we have Weight Watchers and we got way less and things like that. But to be honest, what should they be called? They should be called Massless and Mass Watchers. Because if you go speak to someone and you say, how much do you weigh? Traditionally, I mean, they will generally say to you, the average person will say to you, oh, I weigh, if they're going to tell you, they'll say, I weigh 80 kgs, for example. But that's actually wrong. Do you agree? Weight is actually a force and it's measured in newtons so weight is actually a measure of the force with which you're attracted to the earth okay it is a force um it's a measure of the force that attracts you to the planet you're on to the planet, the planet you're on. Um, okay, so, it, and it's measured in Newtons, whereas mass is a measure of how much matter you're made up of. And this is measured in kilograms or grams, but the SI unit is kilograms. Right, now let's talk about the difference between speed and velocity. The units are the same. Okay, units are the same. So in other words, if I say I was traveling at 100 kilometers an hour for speed, I could say also I was traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, but I need to say that it has to be um, in a direction. So to be, I have traveled 100 kilometers an hour eastwardly, in the easterly direction, um, or northerly direction, or up, or whatever, okay? So the way we work this out is speed is actually the distance divided by the time, okay? Whereas velocity is displacement, displacement versus time. And this is pretty important because let's just do the typical example. Let's pretend that we have a starting point here, A, and we're going to start in point there B. And let's pretend that there is a pretty flower sitting at point B. So let's say you started A and you want to go look at the flower. So what are you going to do? You're going to go straight across. And let's say that that is, I don't know, five meters. However, there might be a little bee and it is flying around, okay? And it might waft around and waft around and waft around and eventually get to the flower. Okay, so this year is the distance and this year is the displacement. And I'm not going to talk about direction in a moment, okay? So displacement is defined as the shortest distance uh, between two points, whereas the Distance, sorry, that's a displacement. The distance is the, the, the length the path actually traveled. The length of the path actually traveled. Okay. I'm um, just going to check something. Yeah, I know. 
so the thing is that Oh, we've just run out of time. Okay, we will continue with distance and displacement and speed and velocity in our next lesson, which will be next week, Tuesday. Have a great day.